kids, you're working with special needs students, whatever you, whatever you teach, you make sure the gospel is centered. The, the world can teach us many things, but the church's job is to be stewards of the gospel. That's what we want to, to teach. Number one, the faithful stewardship of, of, of ministry. Number two is the fearful sentence. The fearful sentence of ministry. Whose judgments of you matter most? When you think about your life, when whose opinion of you matters most? Uh, I know growing up, the, 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 the man's opinion that mattered most to me was, was my dad. Right? Uh, I always wanted to please my father, to make sure that he was approved of, of me. Uh, now it's probably my wife. I want to make sure my wife is approved of me. And my children, I want them to be approved of, of their, their father. Uh, but I think so often in life, we value the wrong judgments, the wrong opinions of us. And this is what Paul is getting at here in verse 3. But what, with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. Uh, now, those of you who do aspire to, to, to the ministry, you are going to be judged constantly by your people. Welcome to the world of, of leadership. If you are a leader, whether you're a boss at work, uh, whether you're a teacher in, in a school setting, or you're a pastor of a church, you are going to be judged. People are always going to analyze you. They're going to approve or disapprove you, right? And how freeing is this thought? Paul says, I don't really care what you think. The final opinion, your opinion of me, does not matter. Because one day I'm going to stand before God, and it's his opinion that really matters. And how much time, how much angst, and how much confusion and hurt do we bring upon ourselves because we value the wrong judgments? We value what these individuals say. You know, there's been times, in, even in the life of this church, that I have valued the opinion of some of you far more than I ought. And your opinion has crippled my ministry because I'm so concerned with, what if I say this, how does this person respond? Rather than, than stepping back and realizing, Lord, I just want to be obedient to you. I want to fear you. I want to honor you more than any, any man. This is what Paul is saying. It is a very small thing to be judged by you or any human court. And I think this idea of small things is really important to us. What if people don't like you? It's a very small thing. There's a lot of people who are not going to like you in life, right? It's a very small thing in comparison to what God thinks of you. This is, this is the, the, the weight of the, of the text here. Look how he goes on. He says, in fact, I do not even judge myself. That's an interesting statement. I, I'm not only concerned, I'm not, I'm not concerned with, with how you judge me. I'm not even concerned how I judge myself. And I love how he says this. He says, for I am not aware of anything against myself. I, I don't think I've done anything wrong. I think I've done things with, with good integrity. I think I've served and loved my people. We even see that at the end of, of um, Acts 20 when Paul says that I'm guilt. I'm, I'm innocent of the blood of you all. I, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God's word. You see it again in Thessalonians, how he says that I was entrusted with this gospel. And you know how I labored night and day to serve you, how I gave myself for you. This was Paul's life. He says, I don't think I've done anything wrong, but that doesn't mean I'm innocent. That doesn't mean I'm innocent. What does he say? For I am not aware of anything that's myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things that are hidden in darkness and will disclose the purpose of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. Let me just say a few things here. This is an excellent verse in how you handle conflict. A wonderful verse. Because you may have a conflict with someone and you could say, I've done nothing wrong. I, I, I don't have anything against you. I can't think of anything in my head that I've done to hurt or offend this person. That does not mean you're innocent. You still could have done something. I remember talking to a young woman um, who was telling me over and over again how I've done, I haven't done anything, I haven't done anything, I haven't done anything, but I knew that people who, who she was talking about had been offended by this person. And I wanted to say, just because you think you haven't done anything wrong doesn't mean you haven't. Sometimes we hurt people unknowingly. And we don't even realize that we do it. I know that there's some of you who I've hurt 
and offended, and I didn't know I did it. And so you opened your mouth and disclosed this is what happened, and, and I, me thinking I was innocent actually was, was guilty uh, of sin against the people that God has called me to shepherd and love. I love how Paul says that. So in relationships, we in conflict, we realize that maybe there is fault in us. We look at examine our own heart, we, we, we test and we approve, and then we leave it to the Lord at the end. There's the trust. I, I, I'm going to confess the sin in my life where I think there's sin, and then I'm going to leave it to the Lord to judge at the last day. And this is the same thing when, when you're dealing with somebody else. The other person may be innocent as well. We may be guilty, and the other person may, may be guilty, but the other cursed person may be innocent. God is going to reveal that in his time. Do not make the judgment before it happens. You know, you think about uh, this, this is the context here is ministry. Now, Paul is being accused as someone who is not a very good speaker. I mentioned this before, but he's kind of like a short, stocky, bald, crooked nose, unibrow, stuttering speaker. He's not the guy like, that's the guy we want at the Passion Conference, right? He's the guy that we want to put in front of people. So people were saying, Paul does not really have uh, a good ministry uh, because of his presentation is poor. Or he doesn't really have a good ministry because he is being, as we will see, um, he's being beaten and in prison and jailed. Therefore, God must not be approved of him. Remember we talked about this this morning, this idea of... um, Habakkuk was complaining against God. There is so much wickedness among the people of God. Justice is going forth perverted. And God, I'm calling out to you, and you are not answering me. He has this complaint against God, and God says, uh, I'm doing a work. The wheels are in motion. Judgment is going to happen. Be patient. See, he couldn't see it, and yet God was still, was still working. I think that when we think about our lives and our lives is specifically in ministry, only time will tell if it's a fruitful ministry. You can have numbers and a crowd, but that does not mean you're successful. You can have a nice house and a good bank account, but that does not mean you're successful. Uh, look at the, the houses around here today. There's a lot of construction happening. Uh, new houses are kind of flying up left and right. Now, the, the, the test is not how fast you build that house but how long that house will last. There's a lot of houses that are built really quickly, and they're built really well, and they're going to survive. And there's some houses that that are are built quickly, and they look great, but they start falling apart really, really soon. And we think about that same analogy in the life of the church and and ministry. There's some ministries that are built really fast, but they're built on straw. And they're going to to burn. They're not not, not built with silver gold that are going to be refined by the fire. Uh, there's some ministries that are built, churches that are built, ministries that are built very fast, and God gives a stress, special anointing of the Spirit, and the church grows, and we say praise God for that, and they're going to survive. But size and speed does not indicate success. You know, we can be discouraged because on a Sunday night, our church is not full, and there's a lot of brown pews open, okay? That means we should probably invite a friend, <laughs> right? Uh, but it also does not mean that we're uh, unsuccessful. You know, early on in, in, in ministry, I know for me, you always feel encouraged or discouraged based on the attendance. You start pastoring and you, you feel encouraged when there's a lot of attendance and you feel discouraged when there's not. Um, but as you grow, you realize that God brings who God wants to bring when he wants to bring them. God has ordained all of you to be here tonight. God has prepared this message for you tonight in the pew, period. God has done that. God has chosen other people to stay at home. That's the Lord's doing. right? Remember we talked about last week. We plant and we water, but who brings the increase? God. God is the one who brings the increase. So we just keep planting and watering. The same thing for your ministries. You're ministering to a family member and you're discouraged because you don't see the fruit. Keep planting, keep watering, keep planting, keep watering. And God, in his good time, will bring bring the increase. We just have to continue to be faithful unto him. Do not judge before the time, before the Lord comes. He will bring the things to light that are hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. And each person, each one will receive his commendation from God. So we live before this fearful sentence of God. Uh, there's that uh, quorum dea, we live before the face of God. That's who we're, who we're trying to please. 
We're not trying to please our, uh, the external people in our life. We, 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 we always want to, to be liked, and there's always this approval of, of our own hearts. But, beloved, we want to live before that day when we stand before God, and he's the one who gives us the final commendation. He's the one that says, well done, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. Right? We want to be faithful unto him. That his opinion matters the most. The Lord will reveal what we cannot see. Then we see this idea of, of, of humility here in verse 6. Uh, this fearful sentence, I think that we, we, we should easily have this humble spirit. Look at verse 6. He says, I have applied all these things to myself and, and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that you, none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. This idea of going against each other is, is detrimental in, in the eyes of God, and it's, it can destroy a church. Anytime factions develop, whether it's a faction in leadership, a faction in, in um, a certain type of ministry, or a faction in a certain type of music, when you sow dissension among the brothers, God hates it. It is of the flesh, and he will have none of it in his church. Right? So we can't go with the flesh, with the fight against the flesh, and walk in the spirit. And this is one of the ways he, how he does that. He says, I'm applying this idea that not to judge before it's time uh, it, between me and Apollos. We're just servants and stewards. Why? Verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Everything you have, church, has been given to you by God. Right? The breath in your lungs... The, the, the ability to read, the ability to be, be raised in a country that has all the freedoms that, that we have, loving parents, um, your ability to understand God's word, uh, your ability even right now to, 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 to process the words that are going into your head and forming thoughts in your brain, all of that is given to you by God. All the success you have in ministry has been given to you by God. If you are a faithful worker and you get promoted in your job, it's not because you're great, because God has given you great gifts. Right? It is all about the Lord. And I think this, this needs to be said again and again because the natural person wants to think about how great we are. Isn't it? We want to puff ourselves up. God really, really needs me. God doesn't need any of us, but yet he chooses to use us. Right? He chooses to take sinners who were wretches and evil in, did evil things um, and rebelled against him to transform them to be his, his servants and stewards of the mysteries of God. God takes us from, from being wretches and he makes us his treasure. His treasure. Because he loves us. But everything that we have has been given to us by him. Everything that we have. So if God brings Park Baptist Church to a place of, of success, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. If your Sunday school class grows from, from three people to 20 people, to God be the glory. It is God who brings the increase. Everything that you have, did you not receive? This is something that we should constantly be sharing with our children, the people that we're discipling, that we should foster a sense of humility. A couple, um, probably about six months ago, uh, it came very clear to me that in some of the young men that I've been discipling, I just saw a, an arrogance in them. And I think the arrogance I saw was their pride in good theology, their pride in their, their doctrine of the church, uh, their pride in discipleship and evangelism. All really, really good things. But they started looking down upon other churches and looking down upon other people who didn't have it. And I think what they, they forgot is that your ability to have good doctrine, your ability to have good discipleship and have good evangelism is a gift to you by God. And I had to analyze my own heart that I was not teaching this. I was not fostering a humble spirit, probably because I had pride in my own life. And we'll, we'll see here later on when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I, I think that um, they were imitating me, and they probably saw a lot of pride in my heart. And seeing that kind of reflected back, back at you was, is a wonderful thing. This is why God gave you children, right? So you could see the sins in your children coming back at you. It is God's kindness to you to see those things. And that we can work to rectify them in our own children and in our own hearts. Paul says this, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, Paul, even talking about the gift of being an apostle, my ability to be a, a do-do ministry was by the grace of God. 
The third thing we see here about ministry, it's a foolish spectacle, a foolish spectacle of ministry. Look at verse 8. Already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. Now he's kind of poking at the pride and the arrogance of this Corinthian church. Now the Corinthian church was known for their gifts. They were known for their tremendous spiritual gifts, gifts of prophecy. And yet the thing that they lack the most is love between the saints. That's why chapter 13 is written, that rebuking chapter of, of love is patient, love is kind. You are not loving, and you are not patient, and you are not kind. Uh, you do not um, lay down your preferences for the sake of the body, but you seek your own way. It's a rebuke. And he's, he's kind of rebuking the church here because this church thought that they had, what it, they had it all together because of their wealth, um, because of their gifts. And this is what Paul says. And, and would that you do not reign so that we might rule with you. Some sarcasm here, verse 9. You see, for I think that God has exhibited us. Notice what he's saying here. This is what I think God is doing with us. I don't think he's, he's st stating it like verbatim, I know the mind of God. But he's saying, listen, this is what I think God is doing in my life. This is why God has allowed this to happen. That us apostles... I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. Paul, as, you, as, as we'll, actually let me just continue to read this, and he, we'll, we'll talk about it, and we'll talk about the why that it happens. Verse 10, it says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. They are in, a, in, in, in the worldly eyes, they are failures. They are failures. They are homeless. They are poorly dressed. They are reviled. They are persecuted. That is not the, the recipe for success. And they're saying, God has done this to us. God has allowed us to be persecuted. God has allowed us to be fools. God has allowed us to be homeless. God has done this. Why? To make a spectacle to the world. To show everyone that loving Christ is more important than worldly things. We know from 2 Corinthians that they know that they have the sentence of death, so they would not trust on themselves, but they would rely on God who raises the dead. This is what he's trying to display. Even go back to chapter 1. At the end of chapter 1, it says that, for considering your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, not many were powerful, not of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. The Corinthians were boasting in themselves and not in the power of God. And Paul's saying, we as apostles are being exhibited to the world so that we would know that God's servants are trusting in him and him alone. It's a powerful passage when we think about this. And God did this. Paul did not care to win respect from the world, but he wanted to be a servant of the gospel and a steward of the mysteries of God. He did not care if anyone knew his name as long as they knew the name of Christ. And I think this is just a heart check for us, you know, living in the West. The, the values of the West are, are flipped in the kingdom. The West values uh, comfort. The West values wealth, authority, and position. And God kind of flip, flips that on its head and says, I value faithfulness. And at the end of the day, I will show you what's successful and what's not. We can judge our, ourselves, our lives, our ministry, comparing it to somebody else, and we can be discouraged. But when we compare it to, are we being faithful unto the Lord? Is the Lord pleased with our labors? Are we trying to the best of our ability to love him, to honor him, to honor our spouses, to honor our kids? If you're doing that, God is pleased. 
God is pleased in Christ. How the world judges or how God judges. We even see that verse again from Habakkuk this morning. You know, Habakkuk was saying that the people of God are, are being wicked. God, why aren't you answering? So he said, I'm going to send the Babylonians. And the Babylonians are going to come and destroy the people of God. We know that they, they were sent into exile. And then he says, the Babylonians, but they need to be punished too for, for their wickedness. And God says, I got that covered. Right? And at the end of Habakkuk chapter 3, he has these great words. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no, no food, the flock be cut off from the gold, and there be no herd, and I in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes 